got a pretty cool topic with somebody who's no stranger to the show of your Lenart Um Most of you know Lenart, so I probably don't have to, to do much of an intro, but just in case there's anybody uh, that doesn't know, Lenart's got a really cool background. Uh, he was the founder and the original developer of a tool called Greylog, which you know a lot of you are at least familiar with. Done some pretty cool things in the realm of network security with his, uh, his project and company called Enzyme. Uh, the, the reason I asked him to come on this week is because he actually spoke last week at Lima Charlie's Mission Control Conference on sort of like the modern state of network security and, and how it's changed drastically over the years. And like, I'm intimately familiar with the subject because um, this, this was one of my first roles in cybersecurity. Like I was working in a skiff in San Antonio, uh, working network intrusion detection. And, uh, and I just remember thinking, damn, like, it's actually kind of wild that, you know, these IDS engineers can be so um, uh, defective. And the reason it was wild to me was like, why is the network traffic so transparent in, in so many cases that, that these IDS engineers can work? But then shortly over the years, you started to see that window just like close and close and close and close. And I mean, sure, you know, new and, and, and novel techniques have come out like J3 and J4, ways to try to like measure and monitor encrypted traffic since everything nowadays is pretty much encrypted. Um, and I know, uh, Lenart, you, you have a lot of very recent experience in this space. So I would, I'm just excited to hear your thoughts and, and, and some, some more of the kind of topics that you had uh, around what network security looks, the security model looks like in 2034. Thanks for having me again. And uh, thanks for having me in uh, DC last week. That was a, that was a fun trip. Um, yeah, it's such a big topic. I, I always struggle to kind of figure out where to even start with that. But I think, Eric, what you said about many, 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 many years ago, that was how you got started or that was when you worked on it. I think this is something that I hear a lot when you talk about network monitoring. Some people have to think a little in the past to remember when they did like full on network monitoring for security. Um, I think that we all do that in a way. I think that we all often look at network signals that might come out of an EDR, there might be something like NetFlow, maybe firewall logs, gateway logs, VPN logs, something's very, very close to networks. Um, but last week I was talking about why I think that you should also, on top of everything else, considering security is layered, right? Um, why you should absolutely do um, kind of dedicated or very specific network monitoring as well. And um, I was talking about how the, the, in the modern network, a lot of people are no longer doing that, um, or they are kind of doing that, but what they're really doing is they install the Snort somewhere or Zeek, uh, formerly known as Bro, somewhere um, so that they can say, yeah, we have an IDS. And so when the auditor knocks on the door, they can show them like, yeah, we've got this IDS and it has written these, oh my God, it has written these 15,000 alerts, whoops. Um, and they're probably, in that case, mostly use thread just with noise and yeah, we have one fine auditors happy. And I think that's a symptom of people not getting enough value out of the network monitoring. And I think that comes back to the fact that, yeah, today, um, a lot of things are encrypted. And that's good. That's a good thing. Please. I mean, I hope they are. If you, if you get a lot of value out of this with an, with an old school tool, and that is because nothing is encrypted, I think then you have bigger problems, right? Um, so I think it's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but that also means that I think the tooling landscape has to adapt with that. Um, and I don't think the answer is to say that you got installed a bunch of root certificates all over the place and you are now decrypting everything, right? I think that, is, that would make this probably even worse. Please don't do that. Um, so I set out when I started working on Enzyme, which some people may already know, but maybe mostly from its Wi-Fi security angle. Um, the other subsystem that it has next to Bluetooth is Ethernet. And that is that is hardcore network data, right? You you, you set it up on a on a, on an inline tab or a mirror port or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, Whitney, should I show up? Should I show my my favorite slide? Or is that the arrow goes to the right and uh, I felt like an MDA because it said cost under it. Um, uh, 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 I think that um, no, I was sorry, I <laughs> derailed myself with that memory. Um, the, the Enzyme subsystem uh, for Ethernet you install on a mirror port, on an inline tab, and just like a Snort, just like a Suricata, just like a Zeek, um, or something like 
dark trace if you really want to, um, is going to, to read all the data and it's going to do stuff with it. Um, the difference, and that is, I think, why I've been thinking so much about this topic and why I could talk about this all day. Um, I, when I looked into, should I build support for Ethernet? Uh, and honestly, that was because I was looking for a way to actually make money with Enzyme, um, not not VC funded. So somebody's got to buy something there at some point, hopefully. Um, I was I was trying to figure out if there's value in Ethernet data. Would someone pay for that? Because I do not want to build another thing that people plug in so they can say they have it for others, um, but something that they get real value from. And I found, and this is now really the, the core thesis that I have, I found that most people are no longer doing it because the value that are going that they're getting from network monitoring is not in line with the cost that it ensures, right? There's a yeah, lot yes. of storage involved. There is a lot of processing power involved. There is, um, if you do it with a lot of the existing tools, you need a lot of training for your analysts to build crazy queries. You're going to have a headless system that sends this stuff into Splunk and you're going to write these multi-line queries to see like, yeah. Oh, here's like a simple outlier detection for my for my DNS queries, for example. And not to mention, not to mention, Lennart, the the network complexity requirements for getting good network visibility. Because because even let's let's wave the magic wand for a second and say that like the the tools and the the storage and all that are are not as expensive, right? Like you could use something free and open source like Archimy and magically you've inherited a hundred terabytes of, uh, of fast storage arrays. But, um, but then now architecturally thinking, now how do I actually get visibility over this very large distributed network, right? It is way harder than I think people think, right? Like the way switches work, traffic doesn't leave the switch if it's within that local broadcast domain. So it's like, you have to now tap every switch segment of your network in order to get that full picture. Or you just do what most folks do, and they're like, "No, we just we just put a tap on our egress switch, and it's like, okay, but even that has problems, right? Like, you know, what's the throughput of that switch, and then what's the throughput of the tap, and like all these other things that that go into it. So architecturally, it's just a nightmare. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think that is something that you that you have to keep in mind when you are thinking about a um, when you're thinking about a a modern network monitoring solution that, that I'm trying to build, right? Um, where definitely the way that the taps, as I call them, were sensors, um, the way they're architected and the way that they're calling up to the enzyme cluster um, is uh, is very much designed for that use case. Where I just had a conversation with someone who said, I, we really don't have a network anymore. Um, I want to put this next to my EDR agent. I want to put this on every endpoint. And yeah, you can do that. You can absolutely do that. Um, you might remember the, the 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 time when you ran Greylock and we ran out of HTTP threads. Um, that is something that now now we know. Yeah, you might want to increase that when you have thousands of thousands of um, of sensors reporting out. But yeah, you can do that as well. So you need this flexibility in deployment, um, and I think you um, you need a a system that is extremely fast and extremely selective at the edge, and then sends up a bunch of data wherever you need it. Um, in this case, this would be would be an enzyme node or multiple nodes that you can run in in, in your uh, AWS wherever you want to run it, um, because it just calls up with HTTP with everything that it saw. And what it what it tries to do is it tries to unlock this value at a reasonable cost by ignoring a lot of things from the beginning and by saying I'm simply going to do less, but I'm going to very uh, with very low touch I'm going to. Uh, make visible all of these signals that are in this data, even if it's encrypted. Um, I think I said uh, when when I gave this talk last week, I said if you're ever kind of bored on a Thursday night and you're not really ready to go to bed yet, um, just pull up a Wireshark and just look at all the stuff. Uh, just look at all the stuff that's in your network. Um, and that is not, I think that, uh, many people might expect that. Yeah, I'm just going to see a lot of TCP and TLS <laughs> and a lot of uh, a lot of bytes, right? And not not a lot more. If you look at the critical protocols that I believe you should be monitoring, there's so much data in the handshakes alone. Um, there is a lot of data that you can infer from patterns of the connections. Um, and there's also a lot of data you can infer simply from the underlying protocol headers and, and, and unencrypted parts. So just knowing what communicates where, right? Just plugging this in and you immediately get a map of 
This is all the connections in your network. Is that cool? Is that what you want? And then setting up policies and saying, I don't want that. I just stopped that. And my policy is that this should never happen. So alert me if that happens in the future. That's something you can do by just looking at, 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 uh, at IP and TCP and, and UDP. Um, but just building a list of here are all the SSH sessions that we saw. And not because there was TCP on port 22, but because I parsed out the, um, the, the SSH handshake. And I can even tell you maybe if this was a key authentication or public authentication, you know, like you get this stuff out of there. Um, give me a list of all my RDP connections, where they came from, where they went, how long they existed, and are there any anomalies and where they went or how many there are. This is all stuff that's in your network data. I, what I don't want you to do is to, to collect giant PCAPs and try to get that value out of it by running custom queries. But what Enzyme in this case, or maybe some other tools as well, are doing is I just assume that that's what you're interested in. And I throw everything else away. I just literally give you one database row that says there was this connection from here to there, and it's a nice table and a nice front end. And yeah, maybe there shouldn't be any SOX tunnels ever in your entire network, right? If that table is empty, good. I plugged it in in my, um, oh, my buddy was working uh, from my office for a while. He plugs in his laptop and I get an alert that there's a SOX tunnel. I'm like, oh, interesting. Could this be the first real production detection that Enzyme ever did? And it was indeed, it was on his, on his MacBook. There was a software that was trying to hide its own tracking software for like user tracking where they click something like that um, by tunneling through a SOX tunnel. Um, thinking that that would, that would stop a pie hole or other things at blockers that you might have. Um, and I could tell in Enzyme, there's just a row in a table that says there was a SOX tunnel from this device to this SOX server, and this was the destination of the tunnel, which happened to be a host name, which was like ingest something horrible tracker. That is, that is filthy. Yeah, something. Are you willing to <laughs> name, and sh name and shame the software that is doing that? Because I, I, I did. I actually did on Twitter a few weeks ago, and I thought it was Zoom, and then I had to backtrack because it wasn't actually Zoom that did this. And then I falsely accused them when I deleted my tweet. It felt very bad about it. Um, but it was some software that, that did that. Now I would have needed an EDR, come back to layers, right? If now he yeah. had on his laptop the EDR that I run, happens to be Lemur Charlie, uh, then I could go in and I could see, hey, what opened that connection, right? And now I could correlate that to a process. And now we're we'll building. That, um, and that's the that is, that is a really good point, Leonard. So, you know, one of my biggest gripes, like you could give me the best network visibility tool ever. And as a as a SOC IR person, one of my biggest gripes is I have no process attribution of any of this stuff, right? Like, like, and in many cases, it's impossible to even get like user attribution. Um, you know, at, at best, you've got the source IP of the traffic, and and if you're lucky, a host name. So like it gets really tricky to say, well, is this normal? Because I don't know, you know, you know, what on the what on the endpoint, you know, is responsible for that. And so yeah, it, it, I think it can be tough to do without correlation, right? Without the ability to kind of say, okay, this endpoint is responsible for this traffic. Um, now how do we feel about it, right? Because RDP could be completely harmless, but it actually also depends on who the two talkers are, right? <laughs> Exactly. Um, this is why so I'm, I'm adding a lot of context um, to IP addresses, MAC addresses. Um, I'm collecting DHCP. I'm collecting ARP. I'm doing reverse DNS internally. So I try to give you all that information out of the box, which is another thing that's going to be not as easy if you if you send this into a SIM or something like that. Um, right. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to tell people to also do network monitoring. I'm not saying, hey, if you run something like Enzyme, you suddenly don't need all these other tools anymore, right? You still need all these tools. You still need EDR, absolutely you do. Um, you still need all the other stuff that you probably have. Um, but that only works if what I am trying to now additionally introduce um, is actually cost effective and it's not very expensive. And that's where being bootstrapped comes in because I don't need to pay someone $100 million back. Um, and this is where um, architecting this to do less from the beginning, but unlocking the real value of your network data um, is coming. Cool. Is what I hope. Leonard, um, in, in your in your talk last week, you uh, you dropped a spicy take that I actually fully agree with. It is also my own spicy take, but I, I think there's a lot of folks in the industry that would probably uh, you know maybe have it have have a different you know opinion. 
Um, but it's it's the topic of SSL interception, right? De decryption of traffic for the purpose of inspecting traffic, right? And for anybody that's not savvy, it's the idea that say your your enterprise, your 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 company network has this big, you know, SSL interception device could be a layer seven firewall or something or a proxy. And they they've had to then deploy enterprise certificates on all of their endpoints so that the, the, the endpoint would trust the man in the middle from an SSL layer, you know, um, level and then and then allow the decryption to happen and then re-encrypt it on its way up. And I think that it's it's a nightmare. I mean there's so many issues and problems with that. And even when it's even when it's implemented and everything is done correctly, like still things go wrong, but just from the privacy and security and, and everything that goes with it, like, I, I just don't think it's the right answer. And you said the same thing last week. I, I'm curious to hear your, your kind of thoughts on that. And if anybody else has competing, you know, perspectives, feel free to, to chip in as well and, or chat about it because it's, it's an interesting take. Yeah. Um, I agree completely with what you just said. Um, and yeah, I'm, uh, I know some people might disagree, but I, I started the talk saying that you might disagree with this, and that's fine. Um, that's I'm, I'm here to share my opinions, and it would be it would be boring if um, uh, if if we all agreed. Uh, but yeah, I mean the the core of it is you just install this. Uh, first of all, you have to you have to distribute all these certificates, and then on top of that, you just install like this central interception point, um, which I mean that's the crown jewels, right? If someone gets into that. Um, you you cannot trust any of the encryption that happened on your on your endpoints anymore. So I think it's way worse than before. Then then please don't do network monitoring if that's your way of doing network monitoring. I would say uh, that's yeah that's my that's my take on that. I think it's a terrible idea. I think I think I have I have another layer of spicy on that take. I think this entire idea was introduced by giant companies that did network monitoring in the old school way and they saw their use case being diminished massively by everyone encrypting everything because they were not designed and architected for the modern world where that is the case like i right. i happen to be uh doing now so their way out of this was like oh yeah you just got to decrypt everything right then suddenly their product still works uh i think that's how that came together i believe that i worked in a really good sense i worked in an organization where we had six or seven data centers that were pushing, I mean, we were pushing like three, four terabytes of logs per day to Splunk just log wise. We had uh, a ton, I'm mean, just petabytes on petabytes of data in our PCAP environment running on end -based DAG cards. And we were doing a lot of network-based detections. We were using the old FireEye devices, which were just ripping off a bunch of snort and emerging threat rules. And it was awesome. And then 2014 hit and SSL started going everywhere and it sucked for us. So we enabled it without asking a lot from the business and then ran into a lot of privacy concerns <laughs> in, a, in a bad way, in a very, very bad way. I'm curious yeah, at this point, with, with modern like uh, HP3 and Quick and such, are there enterprises that are actually and actually be, like that, that they believe not just believe, but they're actually intercepting all outbound HTTPS? Because like newer uh, uh, encryption protocols don't really have an easy way to deploy a root CA or look through right. historically. If you have pushed the root CA, you have to be intercepting it live. Like interception is legitimately harder now than it was, especially if you don't control every aspect of every endpoint and do fail closed and just like, oh, well, this is the outbound traffic. We have no idea what is going on. Our, do, our organizations is, literally think they're doing TLS interception and actually doing so at this point. And, and, and this is why it doesn't work. So Jeff, in my experience, there are organizations that, that are doing it, but I think at least on the, the, the team that manages that solution, they know they're not doing it all and they know that they can't do it all. And they're, they're now buried in a backlog of tickets of broken websites that users can't get to because of the unsupported version of TLS by the proxy. And so they're putting in exception after exception after exception or just telling users, sorry, you can't go to that site, right? And it's not because it's a bad site. It's just because our technology can't de decrypt or inspect it. And it's just great. You're now, you're now, you've created toil for yourself that has no measurable impact on security effect effectiveness of the organization. And then you know, to the counterpoint, and I did see uh, Alex, I think, came in with a, a message in chat, uh, you know, but but it could be necessary in some organizations that have regulatory requirements. But I, I still think 
And again, it's just my opinion. I still think that there's always a different way. There's always a different way to go about it. And one that doesn't break the underlying fabric that secure communication relies on, you know? Just my thought. I, I think you're absolutely right there. It's like it's diminishing value, diminishing more day in day uh, with just more and more exceptions piled in. Uh, it, it's getting to the point that it might be as bad as AV, where we might be better as an industry uh, because we'd focus on other controls with that time compared to spend more and more time on something that's delivering less and less value over time. I love that. Is that too uh, harsh? That's a good summary. <laughs> yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. Yeah. So, Leonard, I'm curious to take then on uh, the fingerprinting um, algorithms like JA3, JA4. Are you using them? What, what do you think their their efficacy is? Like, are they valuable? Are they still helping us find threat actors? Yep, I think they're they're a great additional um, identification methods. What I would call them. Um, I was just in Vegas. Um, I had a very long conversation with with John um, Althaus, the I think the main person behind the the uh, Jaw three and four algorithms. Um, there will be support in that um, for that in Enzyme. Um, I already have all the data. Um, you just need to put them together according to to their standards. Um, I think so. I think also it's a great way for like an IOC like sharing, right? Like let's say you want to see if you have communicated with a certain uh, server with a certain TLS certificate, for example. Um, and yeah, that's a great way. Um, I've seen a demo he showed me. Uh, we're, we're both sitting at the Grey Noise party and had laptops with us and we're the, the antisocial <laughs> people <laughs> who were just uh, doing stuff on their laptop for an hour. Um, yeah, I've seen kind of a way to identify if something is SSH or SCP, depending on the traffic patterns. There's cool stuff in there. Um, I think it's a great additional signal. I don't think it is just by collecting all of that, you've done your network monitoring. Um, but if you do network monitoring, you should absolutely have that, especially now that most vendors do integrate that. And I don't know, maybe you're seeing something in your um, in your Azure environment. Microsoft is now showing you these fingerprints all over the all over the place. Being able to enter that into your other networks monitoring systems um, and comparing that and seeing if you've seen that anywhere else, uh, I think it's super cool. Um, and before I start to come up with a way to easily share and identify these things, I, I just use something that's already standard. So yeah, um, I like it. I think it's a great additional thing to have. Um, I don't think it's an answer by itself on anything. I'm also excited about, if you haven't seen that, they're building the JavaDB, I believe is what it's called, um, which is a giant database of all the fingerprints where they can they can tell you, yep, that's a Chrome version, so-and-so, that just communicated. Um, that was actually going to be my question. Like. I feel like that's been what's missing for so long is some vendor or something crowdsourced, but still authoritative to actually build out what these signatures mean. Um, I, we have a, a lot of attendees with 56 people on. So TLDR of JA3, JA4S, please correct me. Uh, it turns out even though there's encryption, there's still a lot that happens during the ne negotiations. So you can differentiate TLS clients and TLS servers. So I don't care what it is. I care that there's a new TLS client side of organization on this one endpoint. It's worthy of further investigation. Or I don't care what the destination IP is. I care that it matches the default uh, JA3S or JA4 server certificate of Cobalt Strike Team Server. We should investigate this further. It's so much value compared to, sorry, TLS interception. That's Absolutely. super slick. Um, it... Sorry. I was just curious if it was the link I dropped in chat, ja4db.com. Is that the one? I'm going to flick it. Uh, hosted by Fox.io. That's the one. Um, that's, we, had a, yeah. we had a conversation about that. If I can um, pass that through to Enzyme users through my API set I already have. So that it that's just kind of up. I mean, you see a connection. You can tell that's a Chrome so-and-so to a Apache version so-and-so. That's, that's much better than two IP addresses in port 443, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's another thing that I'm pretty excited about. And I believe it's part of their monetization strategy to, to sell access to that because that's under a, a pretty strict license as far as I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that makes sense. Well, my last parting thought on this topic is, you know, at what point do we maybe, I hate to say accept a defeat, but 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 kind of abandon the very, very difficult process of trying to get literal on-network inspection and just 
fall back to the endpoints themselves, right? Obviously, the downside of that is, well, what happens to unmanaged endpoints? I, yeah, I, I see you. But but obviously, Microsoft thinks there's something there as they start to incorporate Zeek into Defender, right? Like So like there's, there's I think, a play there where maybe we start to just trust more of what the endpoint itself can tell us, um, you know, both pre and maybe post um, um, encryption, right? Like now we could actually maybe do that on the box inspection of encrypted traffic, but it never leaves the box itself, right? Like, um, I'm just curious if you have thoughts on it. Uh, yeah, it's, if we can do that, um, then I, I would love to recommend for everyone to do that. Um, I, I just don't see that happening because just like you said, um, what if it's an unmanaged endpoint, right? Um, let's, I, I think, well, so let's say this happened, right? And all of our Linux, Windows, and OS X devices have a level of endpoint management and endpoint monitoring where we do not need network no monitoring. More. Let's say that happened, right? Just, Let's just, say that happened. You just, um, you just debunked my theory. Yeah. Yes, they have that happened. I, I think, and, and I'm not talking about all the OT stuff, all the, I'm in Houston, I look, I look out of the window, I see the, I still think it's the biggest medical center in the world. Um, the, the, um, the amount of cancer research that happens there that the rest of the world or some of the rest of the world wants to get into and get a hold of and just be the things that, I mean, the CT scanner that runs Windows XP on it, right? Like those devices, all of not even thinking about that. Um, let's say we figure this out and it runs absolutely everywhere. I, or on, on it runs on all of our workstation servers and a lot of the other devices. Lee. I think the this will just shift the focus of an attacker to those that don't have it, which I am afraid are also even more vulnerable. I think we're not seeing there's these horror stories about oh, what if someone hacks your printer and then and then pivots through your your smart TV onto your onto your smart oven that sets your I mean, on fire. That's not that far fetched. Yeah, there are APT groups that specifically aim for persistence on unmanaged appliances, which is so, like I'm sorry, but it's a finding in essentially every pen test that you have unmanaged devices. You have more machines with seven zip than you do with your EDR. Fix that. <laughs> I literally just sent down an unmanaged host report where we look for IPs communicating that don't have an agent host name associated with it for our XDR, you know, day job. And this one particular client has tens of thousands. They're a large client, but I mean, it's, it, it, I'm sitting here like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think that had become an street. unsolvable problem at that at that scale. We would shift. Yeah, but you can make it closer. That, you can make progress. Don't just give up, which is what so many organizations. We tried to deploy it once. A bunch of our boxes are inaccessible via WinRM. The one way we tried to deploy it, and therefore we just give up. Or maybe we try once a quarter, a one more massive push. It, there's also. Progress. Devices that are, you know, licensed where you can't touch them, you'll kill your warranty if you touch them. They're OT enabled, which this particular environment happens to be one of those, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where you just can't do the damn thing. There's so many of those that I think network, we don't want to avoid the network. We don't want to toss the network completely. It's still something critically important to us. Love it, guys. Love it. I knew this was going to be a, a good conversation with a lot of, a lot of fun takes and let our, obviously your you're probably among the the, the the top SMEs I know that are digging into network traffic these days. Um, so always love to hear your perspective and uh, and, and kind of keep in touch with what you're doing with Enzyme. Um, thanks so much for joining us today, Mother Art, and everybody else that tuned in. Even Jeff, hey, I didn't expect to see you today. I know you're out still in South Dakota. So thanks for jumping on all this. Uh, always. Everybody else, have an awesome rest of your day, a great weekend, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.